I would want to let anybody out there who is listening listen to your guts. If you want to query someone and you have the chance, just do it. I mean, there is no rule to this publishing. That's one thing I'm learning. There is absolutely just no rule. I agree with that a hundred percent. Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the weekly podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to day of publication. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I hope you're enjoying the podcast and the stories authors are sharing with you. If you are, please consider leaving a review on your podcast app or sharing the episode on social media. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you can go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. Today, we are doing something a little bit different. We have historical romance author Roylan Singh and her agent, Sarah Megabo. Roylan Singh writes through the noise of her two lovely kids, a very supportive husband, and a bank job where numbers rule. She is currently writing historical romances with heroines setting their own norms and coming toe-to-toe with heroes worth loving. She is a huge fan of Bollywood romantic movies and Marvel. So please welcome Roylan to the show. Hello. Hi, and thank you. Yeah, and we also have Sarah, and I'm actually going to have Sarah introduce herself. Aw, thank you, Roylan. It is wonderful to see you and hear you. Sarah, it is wonderful to be on the show. I love popping in and listening to success stories. Um, It's one of those things that just keeps the work joyful is to be able to uh, listen to your podcast. I am a literary agent. Um, have been working in publishing for 15 years and very, very, very happy to be working with Roy Lynn on her debut novel. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, Roy Lynn had contacted me and she was like, how about we have my agent come on? And I was like, okay, well, that's not really the format of the show. And then I checked and I was like, oh, her agent, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah can come on anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really do listen, like listening to your podcast. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Roylan, let's start with you. And let's go kind of all the way back to the beginning. When did you first start getting interested in writing? And how long did it take from then before you started getting serious about pursuing publication? Oh, can I say fourth grade? I mean, (laughs) so my father does work in a government TV channel, like he's an engineer. So Uh, The first time I completed an end-to-end movie script was fourth grade, (laughs) of course. (laughs) But I never thought about like writing, writing until uh, very recently. And uh, the current form of the books and publication in that sense, I think it was about six to seven years ago. I started uh, dabbling in picture books, joined SCBWI in the local uh, groups here, met great people. and. well, it didn't seem as easy as it was. So writing 250 words, <laughs> children's story. Uh, apparently, it was much more difficult than writing a 100K novel. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the seriousness uh, when I got it. Like, I think I was pregnant in 2015. That's the time I finally decided, okay, let me finish this novel. Let me see where it goes. Awesome. So what happened after that? Can you kind of break down for us your journey from then to signing your first book contract? For the first uh, few years, it was very normal. I would write, I would get nervous, I would close it and shut it in the drawer. (laughs) That was rinse and repeat for multiple number of months until finally I got the courage enough to start submitting in contest. Uh, Actually, there is an author I admire, Miss. Uh, Branwan uh, Evans, and she has this great blog post. And I I have been reading her for a very long time. But once I got into those blog posts for authors, and she encouraged so much about contests. So, you know, uh, you're so scared to query the agents, the publishers. Okay, start here. Uh, And I was like, okay, that's for me then. I'm very scared. So I went on to a contest free for a little while, almost for a year or two. Uh, got some great feedback. And by the time that I got courage enough to start querying authors, writing the queries, that was the time when I won also a contest. And I won an entry in Entangled uh, to submit the full manuscript. And I did. I did 
and that was 2019 when I submitted. By the time 2020 started, we all know the story, how 2020 <laughs> started. So I was low in spirits. I never thought anything is going to happen. And I had kind of given up. And I had these batches of my dream agents, which were just sitting there. And I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to query them again. Like nothing's happening. Like 2020, we are doomed. And then in January, I got an offer. I got an offer from Entangled. I was like, that was the first good thing I heard in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wait, I have these, you know, batches of dream agents. I still have to query. Can you wait for me a little bit? Can I please query them? <laughs> and she was great. And uh, uh, she was like, yeah, I mean, you know, we understand. And then I went ahead took that leap of faith. I mean, it was now or never because, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I was keen on the offer as is. Sarah knows a lot <laughs> behind the scenes. But yeah, and um, I went ahead, queried some of those, got multiple offers. And uh, I think uh, Sarah was the most passionate for the project. And mm. I saw in her vision something that even I couldn't see for my own books. There we went. I think 2022, great things happened for me. Otherwise, in a very bleak, bleak year, I got the book deal and I signed with Sarah. That tided me over the entire year, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Can you uh, go ahead and read your successful query letter for us? So here is it. And um, also it has a slightly different title since I already had a publication offer. I had that in my subject. Uh, saying that offer of publication. But other than that, it reads pretty much like a normal query. Dear Ms. Sarah Megubo, I'm seeking representation with an offer of publication in hand. Asius White, the Duke of Saxton, couldn't save his father, but he will be damned if he won't save his dream. He'll acquire a triple crown winner horse at any cost, even marriage. Miss Dina Campbell wants only a soulmate, and hell will freeze over before she'd marry a horse mad man who loves horses more than a woman. An only way to settle? A game of challenges where a winner gets it all. If only their fairy will stop clashing and sizzling kisses don't get in the way. Betting on a Duke's heart is complete at 99,600 words, set in late Victorian era 1895, with a touch of Indian culture for Dina. It's a classic marriage of convenience trope targeted towards the romance readers, with a liking of strong heroines, horses, and a little of Indian mythology. This manuscript is a winner of Indian Golden Opportunity 2019, second place winner in a VRW Fool for Love Contest 2019, and a third place winner in a NJ Put Your Heart in a Book 2019. I am a member of RWA and being an Asian Indian, a Bollywood enthusiast, the novel describes a few Indian rituals and places from my experience and research. I also invest in workshops, writer university classes, and Netflix for honing my craft. Thank you for your time. Looking forward to hearing from you. Yay! Nice. <laughs> and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I, I, I was just having a beating heart when I hit the scent anyway. My world <laughs> went wild way later, but thank you. If anyone wants to read that, you can find a link to the query in the show notes. But Sarah, can we get your reaction? What about this query letter grabbed your attention? <laughs> well, well uh, so Royal Lynn, while you were talking a second ago about Bronwyn Evans, I pulled up my reading list because I have this like extensive spreadsheet of everything I've read in the past 15 years by release date and by genre and by publishing house and by editor. I, it's very nerdy. Uh, but yes, I started reading Bronwyn Evans um, with Addicted to the Duke, which was several years ago. And I think the first thing, so Sarah, you asked me what attracted to me about the query is I am a huge historical romance lover. My go-to pleasure read is a mass market paperback Regency historical 90% of the time. <laughs> So, you know, the first thing, obviously, is that the query letter is crafted correctly, 
you know, it accurately identifies the genre of the book and says it's complete. I, I do remember seeing the 99,000 words and going, oh, good, even more for us to love. <laughs> what I loved about this is, and, and I'm so glad you have me here today, because this is an, a unique situation where there's an author who comes with an offer already on the table. And I want to talk about that at some point, because it's, it's fraught with logistical nightmares sometimes. And so I, I want to talk about that later. But for now, you know, basically, the query letter demonstrates very strong narrative voice. The idea that our heroine, Dina, doesn't want to marry a horse mad man. I love that line. It's very, very strong. And the idea that our hero, Aetius, couldn't save his father but wants to save his father's dream. It's a very succinct and compelling way to describe the character, and I really, really liked it. So basically, the, you know, the, the narrative voice is very strong. The craft is very strong. I'm a huge historical romance fan, and the story itself sounded just very compelling, which of course it is. Yeah. You have those like directly conflicting goals and motivations of the main characters, which just makes for a delicious romance storyline for sure. Exactly. Thank you. That's actually the next question, Sarah. What did the process look like after you received Roland's query letter on your end? That's an excellent question. So my general process is I spend maybe a half, 20 minutes to a half an hour each afternoon reading queries. And I will respond to them right away. And everybody who gets who sends an inquiry receives a response. If I think that the query has potential, then I flag it and I go back and I reread it again. And if I think it still has potential, then I move it into a different file marked ask for 30 pages. Probably twice a week, I go into that file that says ask for 30 pages and I copy and paste an email that says, I really enjoyed your query letter. Can you please send me, I guess it's 50 pages of the manuscript. So, and then as those come in, they go into a different file marked re, you know, these are 50 pages. And so after I've completed reading queries, usually again, once a day or once every other day, I will take time to read those 50 page submissions. And I want it to be quiet. And I want things not to be too distracting. And I want to have full attention and I read them. And as I read, I mark them as no's or yeses. And if they are yeses, I will go back the following day and reread it yet again to see if it is still a yes, and then I will ask for the full manuscript. So that's sort of my process. It involves a whole heck of a lot of spreadsheets and files and rereading. Royal Lynn's query came in. Now, what's different about it is that it said I have an offer on the table already. I will admit that most of the time that's an automatic rejection hmm. because and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because I don't want to be known as the agent who just steps in and takes a free 15% for something that I didn't sell. Two is because the publisher knows, and this is a gross overgeneralization, so take this with a grain of salt, the publisher knows that, that we don't have very much leverage, right? The publisher knows that there hasn't been an agent out there shopping it more widely, and that can be a detriment when we come to negotiations. It isn't always, and again, take it with a grain of salt, but that is one way. That's an, the second reason I sometimes steer away from queries that say they already have an offer on the table. And the third reason is because I have a little bit of OCD to me when I when it comes to submissions. And so I like to sort of control the submission myself. So if the author has already submitted to publishers, it's more difficult for me to control the submission. So those are the three reasons I tend to automatically reject. But in this case, Roiland's writing was so strong and so compelling. And Sarah, like you said, there's like very clear conflict between the hero and the heroine, which makes for absolutely delicious romance. It was exactly what I was looking for. So in this case, the process I'm pretty sure was I asked for the whole manuscript right away and asked whether or not Roiland had already accepted the offer, which if I remember correctly, she had not. And then I asked if there was a deadline. And so then it, I don't move it to the top of my pile because everybody would be at the top of my pile, but I do flag it in a way, which means that if I'm going to commit to getting back to this author in a timely manner, I need to know what that timely manner is. So that was a very, very long answer, but that's sort of, that's my general process. And that was my process for this particular query. Awesome. So when she decided that you did want to represent her, what happened at that point? Roiland, what happened? Did I email you and say, let's set up a phone call? We had, I think, about 20 emails going back and forth. <laughs> but yes, and then we had uh, set up a phone call and, you know, I think went on about an hour. 
So th- that was some great chat. Um, as I said, I mean, I I saw in her vision things that I didn't even know myself. So, and when you when I called to offer representation, did you already have like a list of questions you're supposed to ask an agent? Yes. So, okay. So you probably asked me a lot of questions and then I told you things like how much I love the book and where I see it fitting on the shelf and things like that. Not as much as I'm hearing now. So thank (laughs) you, Mother Sarah. (laughs) But yes. All right. I will repeat for the masses. I really love your book. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny because I actually got my agent in a similar manner. I had an offer on the table from a publisher. However, I'd already queried agents. And I had several agents who had either partials or fulls. And so those are the agents that I contacted. And they asked me the same question, you know, have you accepted the offer? And two, are you set on accepting the offer? But we actually did end up going with that first offer, mainly because we were on the tail end of a trend. And so we knew it was going to be a difficult market for that book. I would like to mention something here. So when I got the offer of publication, I think I took a day off. And I scoured the internet for advice on what to do about the agents. Because as I said, I had a batch, uh, actually a couple of batches of dream agents list, which I wanted to query so badly. And I didn't. I I hadn't. I, I wasn't in that mindset in January 2020 to do that. And then now I have the offer. And I was like, every single blog on the internet tells you just to go back and deal with the agents that you've already queried, right? You might have partials, you might have fulls out with them, and you might have just queried them and not heard back from them yet. I took a chance. I was so desperate to query these uh, agents. and Some of them had been brand new in the field, and I was very excited, read about them. And then there, of course, the season one. But I desperately wanted to query them. And after a day of going through everything, my eyes were paining literally, but there was not a single validating advice who would tell me, it's okay, you know, go and query a new (laughs) agent. It's okay. (laughs) Nobody would validate that for me. And the second day, (laughs) I went there and did that anyway. (laughs) I... (laughs) So I very, very specifically called it out, of course, in the query also. Mm-hmm. And I contacted back the agents with whom I had the full spatials and queries as well. I would want to let anybody out there who's listening, listen to your guts. If you want to query someone and you have the chance, just do it. I mean, there is no rule to this publishing. That's one thing I'm learning. There is absolutely just no rule. I agree <laughs> with that 100%. Nice. All right, Roiland, how has your experience been since signing your contract? Were there any kind of surprises about the publishing process along the way that you'd like to share? I think surprises was the norm. Uh, <laughs> that is that is the hashtag. <laughs> that is, exactly. I mean, <laughs> so one, it was 2020. We had absolutely no idea how things were going to go. And that includes, I think, me, my editor, my publisher. Can I... Include your name too, Sarah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing, though, uh, my uh, on my personal front, the job scenario was very risky. So we were going through our own insecurity, so to speak, in the house. We couldn't go to India. We couldn't see family, which was almost three years after. So I was already going through some different things. So on the publishing front, I was not ready for anything. So everything was a surprise. <laughs> I was not ready for the number of times I needed to read my book again and again and again. And oh, my God, (laughs) like (laughs) people be ready to read it thousand times. It's it's crazy. I was also not very ready to prepare for everything that goes along with the book, like the cover aspect, like the blurbs. The jacket copy, the little tiny things that, uh, you know, you, you don't even think about it when you pick another book, you start reading. The whole package is so many things put together and I was not ready for it. <laughs> and then came the actual release plan, the whole schedule and things you need to do. That was another surprise. I mean, yep. you know, I was supposed to just sit at my desk and write. 
<laughs> I was not supposed to go out, market myself, market my book, talk about my book. I mean, how many times I can talk about my own book? I mean, it's just crazy. But yeah, um, I think I might be the exception, though, because as I got in touch with some of the fellow authors, I came to know many of them come prepared to the game about this. They have had built the platforms and they have had, you know, an understanding of publication journey already. They've learned this way. So if someone wants to avoid these kind of surprises, I definitely recommend being prepared, read, get in touch with other authors. And one last thing I would like to recommend from surprise point of view, I was prepared to be a very solo type of writer, you know, just sitting at a desk, not knowing anyone assuming everyone is going to sit at their desk and not knowing anyone. But I was so glad when one of the fellow authors uh, got in touch and they pulled me into a support group. So there is this group of 2021 debut authors. And when I joined, that was such a revelation. There were so many people going through the same experiences. So that was a pleasant surprise I was not ready for, but it was really good. So find your support group and just not for querying, just not for anything. But, you know, people are out there. Everybody is looking for connections. It's, it's just wonderful once you get with others going through the same journey that you are. Yeah. And I'll just jump in to say, Royal, and I think you did a great job. Thank you. One of the things that we see in publishing, like you said, seriously, is chaos is the norm. Change is the norm. Unpredictability is the norm. And you did the right thing. You asked me. You know, so many times people go screaming onto Twitter or, you know, to somebody else with, and they get incorrect information, which stokes the frustration and the confusion, not to mention that it was 2020, which was already confusing and frustrating, but you did the right thing every single time. You went and got a support group with the writers. You asked me questions. I mean, I remember, I think all of my new writers ask questions about pricing and about covers. And you asked questions about pricing and about covers. And, and, and so, I mean, I should have a copy and paste, right? Oh, this is the time when the author is going to ask me about pricing. Copy, paste. Here's the information. Oh, this is the time when the author is going to ask me about covers. Copy, paste. You know, but it, that's so, it's so reassuring for a profitable and happy and healthy long-term career when the author feels comfortable and has the presence of mind to ask teammates right? The agent and, and beta readers and family and the people that support us. And so this is just me saying thank you because yes, I know it was a very, very, very whirlwind year and you did everything right. Oh, thank you for being there. Every single time I asked a question, she is so prompt to respond. I was like, I was always assured. So thank you. <laughs> this is the quick round. I call it author DNA. So most of the questions are writing related. So most of them will just be for Royalin, but I do have a couple that um, I'll ask both of you to answer. The first one is, are you a pantser or a plotter? Panster, 200%. <laughs> do you tend to be an overwriter or an underwriter on your first draft? Overwriter. Hmm. I could have guessed that from the 99K. <laughs> 99,600 words, yeah. <laughs> do you prefer to write in the morning or at nighttime? night. When you're starting with a new project, do you typically start with character or plot or concept or something else first? I think it's a mix of character and a plot. The rest comes later. This one is for both of you. Do you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee. None. Coffee, coffee, coffee. None. None? <laughs> None. I'm like, <laughs> what kind of author am I? But... <laughs> Let's see. Although in 2021, really wine. Yeah. And then coffee and then ice cream. <laughs> Even that, none. I, I don't know how I survived. So I don't drink. I don't also drink coffee and tea. I'm usually just on hot water because I'm a cold baby. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what got me through 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever gotten that answer before. I did get Diet Coke instead, though, once. <laughs> Right. I, I can probably add Bone Vita. It's kind of a chocolate drink brand uh, that Nescafe has in India. And my kids drink here and sometimes they will have leftovers. You know, I'll prepare a glass for them and then they are not in the mood. <laughs> so I chug it in happily with 
Yeah, again, not like a normal. Oh, every day morning, I have to get up and get this glass of no, no. Okay, <laughs> this one is also for both of you. So for Roylin, when you're writing, and Sarah, whenever you're working on, you know, agenting stuff, editing that kind of stuff, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? Silence, silence, or extreme chaos. <laughs> oh, I love that answer. So I have to sit in quiet. Otherwise, it has to be a play date or four or five kids in my house. Then I can write. But if it's somewhere in the middle, mm-mm, not even music. Yeah. When it comes to writing the first draft, are you more of a get it down kind of person or a get it right kind of person? Oh, get it down. I want it. I, I'm, I'm borrowing that word from one of the other um, authors that I've heard it from. I warm it all over the places. <laughs> yeah. What tools or software do you use to draft? I started with Word, but now I am a 100% Scrivener user. I am getting used to pro writing aid, but my editor and the amount of notes I get back from my copy editor and the proofwriter, I don't think it's that effective. So <laughs> I'll keep it because I bought it, but yeah, mm. I'm going to trust my editors. Yeah. Do you prefer drafting or revising more? Revising. If I ever finish a draft, I'm happy to revise it for two years. Just don't make me write. Don't make me write. (laughs) (laughs) Do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? Now, as I said, vomit, hop around, hop around and vomit. (laughs) I'll write a black moment and vomit all around. I'll have a fight with my husband and then I'll write a gruesome grovel scene first. And (laughs) so, yeah, it's absolutely chaos all the way hopping around. This is great. All right. For both of you, are you an extrovert or an introvert? After COVID, I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) I used to be an extrovert and now I find myself most of the time sitting in absolute silence, just staring at the screen, thinking that my brain is a Swiss cheese. (laughs) You might be an extrovert then because I'm an extrovert and I feel like all this alone time is like zapped all my energy. Yeah. Okay. Let's go with that. (laughs) I'm an extrovert in real life, but talking about book, I think I'm an introvert as an author. It takes a lot for me to be comfortable, start talking about myself, writing, you know, get in touch, reach out to even other people. So, well, we are two people anyway. So (laughs) So the show is called Queries, Qualms and Quirks. First, we're going to ask Royal Inn, what were some of the worries that you had on your journey? And were they realized or did you overcome them or how did they shake out? So the first things first, as I said, I started with picture books. It's extremely hard. Sometimes the text that you would write is shorter than the length of the query. So writing a query was so hard. It was extremely hard. And there are some excellent resources on the internet. Um, Everyone knows Query Shark. So (laughs) I went on and went through every single query. So that, that was really a hard part. I never trusted myself. To be able to write a query nicely enough, it, it was a lot of insecurity. But then I think it was just practice, 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 practice. I don't know. That was how it was for me. For me to overcome my query fear, I just had to write hundreds of queries, get rejected and write a new one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is all there it is. The second thing, and I talked about it a little bit earlier, was my fear, right? I have these dream agents. What do I do? I want to query them, but everybody in the world is telling me it's bad form or, you know, don't do that. So I was scared. I was scared I'm going to be blacklisted in the publishing world if I do this or something dire is going to happen. For someone who doesn't know the other side of the world yet, we are still outside of the publishing world, right? You're always fearful. You you always have all these fears. And as I said, I took a day off and I couldn't sleep. So next morning, I knew I just had to do it. I couldn't come back to that lay regretting letter that I didn't query the agents that I wanted to query. Mm-hmm. That's that. I think I just had to be firm. And the third thing, after I did send out that query, I shouldn't say this, but I don't know. You can probably edit it out. Can I mention I got my trope wrong in the query? Oh, no. So after after five years of querying different genres and trying your best to understand what you're trying to do, I still got the trope wrong in my query. <laughs> 
So it says um, arranged uh, marriage of convenience. There is no marriage of convenience in the entire book. And I'm like, what happens now? And then we actually got to talk about it later. And then I figured out it's not this trope. It's something else. But thank goodness it didn't mess my chances. <laughs> but that's all I would say about it. <laughs> so. Nice. I love asking writers what their fears were on the podcast because I think it helps a lot of people see that they're not alone. It also shows writers that even the things that you worry about probably aren't as a big a deal as you make them in your head. (laughs) But Sarah, what are some of the most common worries that you see writers have whenever they sign with you and your conversations with them? How often will I hear from you? I think that's probably the number one question. You know, it's couched as, or it's, or it's, or it's asked as, what's your communication style? But I think the biggest worry is, you know, am I going to go days, weeks, months without hearing from my agent? Yeah, I see that one a lot too. Mm-hmm. All right, Roiland, we're going to talk about that third cue from the podcast title. Do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your writing process that you think is kind of different or interesting or unique? Though I do think you're vomit hop around method is quite unique. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Well, as I said, I wasn't very, very serious about publishing industry, especially um, in the Western world, right? I I said I was a Bollywood enthusiast and I still have that notebook where I have this entire screenplay written by a fourth grader, whatever. But the first thing was finding the time. And as a parent, it was so hard What I started doing was sitting in the Taekwondo classes and the moment his teacher would start the prayer in Korean, I could shift gears in my head and start writing. So there are these 50 parents sitting on the pews and these kids are doing all ha, hu, and all that Taekwondo noises and fights. And I had to train myself to write then. And I could. Later, it was the norm. So every time I'm just sitting there and some of the other fellow uh, parents, they are coming in, they're asking. And of course, nobody knows I'm writing, so I won't tell them. I. <laughs> so it, it, it just developed into a quirk over the time that I'm writing here about someone, someone is getting mad at someone. And then I'll laugh like this. Oh, I'm having a work meeting. I have to send a report, something like that. <laughs> so that's like it became a thing with me. And the other thing is, so I had to start utilizing my breaks. And so I got a little notes thing on the phone and I started vomiting scene by scene and you know, paragraphs by paragraphs. And I'm sitting in a work meeting and then an idea would come in. And then what do you do? Like, I can't go outside <laughs> of the meeting. And so I would just write like one paragraph and I would do, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, that is right. I don't think I messed any of my day job work because of it. But I'm sure a few people definitely raised an eyebrow what exactly I was doing. So, <laughs> but I'm now used to it. Those are the couple of things that I just wanted to say. Braylon, can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons you learned on your journey to publication that you would like to share with them? Patience. I don't think it's a new lesson. But oh my God, be patient. If I draw a little bit from my religious learnings, there is a saying from Gita, which, you know, every one of us has listened to when we were children from our parents or even from the shows that go around. It is said that you are not going to get more than what you are allotted before the time you are going to get it. But at the same time, he also says, if you're just going to sit on your haunches and absolutely do nothing, you are going to get absolutely nothing at all. So do your karma and be patient. Things will happen. But giving up is not an option. I had thought so many times of, you know, every time my kid got sick, every time I thought I didn't get a good feedback, every time beta reader just trashed my book, you know, every, every time, every single time I thought of, this is going nowhere. I'm just nowhere. I'm going to just leave this. But be patient. Work on what you are working on and things will happen. That's absolutely the one single thing I've learned about. Nice. So I usually ask when you're in the lowest parts of your journey, what kept you going? But you pretty much answered that with the same question. So well done. Two questions, one answer. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> 
Sarah, what do you wish that more writers knew or understood before they started querying? I think the top thing would be that each and every writer's journey is different and that even the same writer, the same author, book to book, the journey is different. If somebody very big and important says on Twitter, you should do this to make money, that's not necessarily accurate because each author should be in a position to vet their own situation for what is best for them. Mm. I think that's my two cents. Yeah, I think that's great. There's a the common advice that's like now kind of controversial is like write every day. Right. And for a while that did a lot of damage to me because like as a bipolar author, I can't write every day. And so I just thought, well, I can't be an author then, but that's not true at all. <laughs> Can I take a pause and actually counter that? If it's possible, don't write every day. <laughs> you know, it drains you and nobody talks about it. Yeah. The fatigue is real. Just the pressure of, even if you are just going to li- write 10 lines, but the pressure of just the concept of writing every day, it's too much. And everyone is unique. It's not going to work. I mean, yeah, I would be nowhere with that daily writing. And you're both published authors and you did it your own way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. This is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. I call this the acknowledgments portion of the podcast. So Royland, who are some of the people who helped you along the way to publication and how? Okay, first and foremost is I think my family, my mom and dad, actually, they don't know a word of what I have written, but they have been so sweet and they would celebrate even the tiniest happiness that I did. And, you know, coming from the background I come from, from the middle class, the four sisters, the usual expectation of marrying well. And then, you know, like mold yourself into how the in-laws' houses run. It was tremendous for me to have my mom's and dad's support. Listen, you you live your dreams and everyone can do it. You can do it too. Outside of my family and friends, I absolutely, she's here, but I mean, I'm going to say that anyway. I, I, I had absolutely no idea how this industry was and I wouldn't have reached to this day without Sarah's help at every single con. It was so easy for her to say no in so many cases, but she didn't. You know, she took time out and talked through things with me. It, it was great having your support. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Then there is my husband who doubles as dishwasher and cook at times. Like right now, he's taking care of the kids. So. Yeah, he, he doesn't know what goes on, but he, he's just happy to let me be at times. At other times, he won't, then we fight, but yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would definitely shout these out. For this particular book, I would like to thank my editor. She was so patient. I mean, looking back, I think I gave her more of the rough time than many of her other authors, probably. Because sometimes, it just is, for a new author, probably sometimes it takes time to understand the way uh, edit notes are. And she was really patient. She waited. She gave me extensions and whatnot. That that was a great experience from my end, too. So. I got a chance to listen to Betting on a Duke's Heart, the audio book. And I really enjoyed it. I am not a historical fan, unlike Sarah. (laughs) But I keep saying that. But then like every historical book I read, I really enjoy. But of course, I'm only reading the ones that are recommended to me. So I guess, (laughs) you know, I'm getting the best ones. Um, But I really enjoyed it. But I also really enjoyed the myth story that Dina was translating that is weaved into the story of your book. Why did you decide to use kind of that? method you know why did you decide to weave that story along with your story so here is the thing i grew up in india i went to the school systems in india we have zero education about any other mythologies in the world our libraries won't stock them i have no idea about these greek mythologies and other things Hmm. so if my father wouldn't be in a government office with access to government libraries from time to time i wouldn't have never learned about most of the greek mythology or some of the others that being said whenever i read romance books which started with some of those 
mythology stories you know um, i don't have any book names on top of my head it was just like i am getting a bonus like you know i am learning about that mythology i am learning about the culture and every author thought about something something was there in that story they wanted to weave into their main story that connection i just ended up loving it so i think it wasn't decided when i started to write the book as i said vomit 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 right so there was no <laughs> plan <laughs> but i have been a die hard pl- a fan of mahabharat i'm like you give me 100 versions of it and i still keep digging it and, and it's endless there is no limit to this particular epic it is one of the biggest epic in the world as is i think it's uh, you know so there is just no end to it and it's so fascinating to me since childhood so when i was almost done with the story i i remembered this other story from mahabharat which has the similar back and forth back and forth back and forth of so many tragedies they had to go through and you know at the end of the day they are revered in india as one of the most romantic mythological couple and you know there are odes on them and poetry and what not and a lot of art done paintings and stuff like that so it just kept hitting me that my novel is not done not done without that so i went back and redid it and that's how it came out to be i think if if an author has a perspective it's going to reflect in what they are going to write so it's my way of reflecting my love of my mythology and inserting that into the book nice i loved it and the audiobook especially the female narrator is so charming she's so good she is wonderful yeah thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to me today oh sarah thank you for having us thank you for having me this was my first podcast i'm so glad it was you know such a wonderful you made it so you made it look so easy i don't think it's so easy <laughs> but thank you thanks thanks for easing me into it awesome that is always my goal as an event planner and podcaster is to make things easy on the authors i work with well, thank, thank you. you thank you so much for listening to this episode of queries qualms and quirks You can find the text of Royland's query in the show notes, along with links to find out more about her and her books. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on your podcast app, tell your friends, or share this episode on social media. And if you're interested in supporting the show, go to patreon.com slash pubtalklive. If you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description, or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. That's Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. 